reality, you do the same thing. This is a useful fiction that we all retain in order to get by. As we continue to explore the human genome, this question of environment versus genes, nature versus nurture, will remain a central issue. A chimp could pass for upper class in gloves and a cravat. Is there a gene for humor? Why didn't I think of that? Who was I sitting next to? Who do you think? Is there a gene for gossip? Up in the hot tub? Are there genes for specific criminal behavior? We have hypothesized that there may exist in men's brains an evolved mechanism that pays attention to the vulnerability of females. Professor Thornhill has co-authored a book in which he argues that genes play a major role in behavior, that there is an evolutionary basis for rape. Thornhill notes that rape adaptations have evolved in other species, and perhaps there is a similar adaptation in some human males. Females are evolving on the evolutionary time scale to control which male fertilizes their eggs. Males are evolving to circumvent that control. And that's a sexual conflict that occurs in the context of rape. Thornhill raises a most controversial question. How much of our behavior do we control? And how much is pre-wired? the result of millions of years of evolution. As the human genome is unraveled and decoded, perhaps we will find a sequence that drives the behavioral impulse in some men to rape, and genes for other criminal behavior as well. Could we then snip them out of future generations? And along with the elimination of bad traits, we might want to insert better traits. Designing by snipping and pasting in the best genes. Forcing the evolution of new variations in the human species. We already select for traits in children. When you select a mate, that's what you're doing. You pick somebody who who you like the looks of and the behavior of and so on. What you're doing, whether you know it or not, is you're selecting somebody you want to help you get your genes into the next generation. As we consider the prospects of controlling our own evolution, it is easy to get caught up in the media hype about the human genome. But what are the real probabilities? To actually design humans is, for now, a fantasy. We have 100 trillion cells. We have 50,000 genes that lead to a million different proteins, all in different combinations in those 100 trillion cells. Attempts to engineer the genetic codes of even simple, tiny insects have occasionally surprised researchers. The results in one case were particularly strange. Fruit flies have been at the center of genetic research since the beginning. The very first gene ever studied caused mutant male offspring with white eyes. Normally, fruit flies have red eyes. A mutant white-eyed fly appeared in the first fly bottles near the turn of the 20th century in Thomas Hunt Morgan's lab at Columbia. And that got him started on opening up the science of the gene. Researchers don't operate on the tiny flies by hand anymore. Now there is a micro-machine controlling a glass needle that punches DNA fragments directly into the embryo of a fruit fly. Recently, scientists at the National Institute of Health in the U.S. were injecting DNA to study nerve cell development. In the course of their work, they injected the white-eyed gene as a marker to confirm that the offspring had successfully received other experimental DNA. So you could say it was the best known gene on Earth, the oldest, uh, most studied gene in uh, genetics labs, and it had this completely bizarre, unexplained consequence for behavior that nobody had suspected. The male fruit flies all had the white eyes as expected, but their behavior was unexpected, bizarre. Where the males were actively courting each other, 
and they were generating these long chains of flies that would, where the lead nail would frequently come around and interact with the end of the chain or partner in the, in the middle of the chain. Further experiments confirmed that it was the mutant gene for white eyes that also produced the strange behavior. It was a major behavioral change. I mean, a huge amount of change came from just that one uh, alteration in one letter of one gene in, in the fly, and it was a gene that was only supposed to affect the eye color of the fly. So to me, that says we're only at the very beginning of understanding how genes connect with behavior, how our attraction for each other is shaped by our genes, how our bodies and our behavior are inherited, and passed on. All of that, we're just very much at the beginning of understanding. We may have only just begun to understand how to control our own evolution. But no one can deny, after experiencing developments in the last decade, that technological progress is exploding exponentially. I think it's so important for all of us to have some kind of working knowledge of what evolution is, how it works, what DNA is, how DNA is connected with behavior. We really do now have the prospect of holding our own evolution in our hands and making the decisions that always before have been made by wind storms and climate changes and volcanoes. All of that now becomes possible for us and at a level of control that was never possible before. There is grandeur in this view of life. Charles Darwin wrote at the end of Origin of Species. From so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. <laughs>